So we're going to talk about three boasts. Probably sounds like an odd title for a sermon. We've been talking about live what you believe. And, but I think it's really easy for us at times to start bragging about the things we have and the things we do. And, and as a result, we, we kind of turn in a direction that makes it really hard for other people to come to the saving faith of Jesus Christ. And sometimes, too, it's just a failure to live what we said we believed. We, we start to rely on the wrong things. We start to measure by the wrong measurements. It's like uh, the parable in Luke 18, you know, where the two men go into the temple and the one's a Pharisee and the other one is a tax collector. He's like the most despised person on the planet at that time. Still, today, I think that still applies as far as that goes. If you work for the IRS, I'm sorry, you can be forgiven. It's all right, you'll be but the Pharisee goes forward, you know, and prays and says, Thank you, Lord, that I'm not like that guy back there or any number of other people. He's meant to, you know, nobody really gets left off his list. But he is just glad that he's better than them. And the tax collector at the back smacks his chest and says, Forgive me, Lord, a sinner. And Jesus says, He is more righteous than the Pharisee in the front. So we need to be careful that we don't slip into Pharisee mode and start saying things and doing things that are more boastful about us and less about our reliance and dependence on our Savior. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today. There's several verses we're going to be reading. We'll read through them first, then we'll kind of break them down. Uh, but I'm going to pray for us before we do that, just so our hearts and minds are prepared to hear what we read. Uh, so let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you a people that can be very proud. A people that can be very entitled. A people that can, at times, uh, draw comparisons in an attempt to make ourselves look better. And I pray, Lord, that today we just come to you humbled by who you are and who we really are. We are sinners, Lord, undeserving of your mercy or grace, completely reliant on the work of your Son. And Lord, I pray that as we look through these verses, when it's so easy to hold up a checklist or hold up a comparison chart that will hold up mirrors, that we will look at our own face, and realize that we need you. And so does everybody else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. James 4, 11 through 5, 9 says, Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks evil, speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. And there is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. As such boasting, all such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is a sin. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth eaten. Your gold and silver, silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person, he who does not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, 
being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be a patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing in the door. Or at the door. It's important that we understand that in these verses, I, I personally feel like there's at least three aspects of boasting that we'll develop more as we go through it. But if you remember how James started his instructions to the believers, he reminds them about standing fast in trial. He reminds them even that they should count it all joy when they go through those trials. And I said that was because pressure, when it's applied, reveals true belief. Whether or not you truly believe what you say you believe comes out in those moments. In the time, I used the analogy about the fact that there's lots of times people say they're going to fight and then they fail to show up. Or in a military setting, that say they're going to run forward when bullets fly and they run backwards when bullets fly. Pressure, trials reveal true things about us. And sometimes they can do that in our boasting. Because we're so self-assured about our standing, our place, our possessions, our, those things that when trials come or when we face trials from God, we just start instantly showing our list of things. Look, I'm better than them. I don't do the same things those people do. I have better things than them. That proves that I must do better. We start to think that way, and in so doing, we distort the Word of God, our own witness, and at times condemn ourselves because the judge is standing at the door. And the picture there is you're inside thinking you're having a private conversation, and you turn around, and there stands the Lord. So when we get into boasting, we need to remember at times that there stands the Lord. Remember in the beginning, James 1, 22 through 25 says, Be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. He goes on to say in 26, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. He tells us in James 3, 5, So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. The tongue, the thing we say, we say has weight that can build and destroy. Andrew spoke about this last week as well. I only recap all of this so that you can see a theme, a common theme that runs throughout James and what he means when it comes to using our mouth is that we're to say what matters and not what doesn't. But too often we're too busy saying the things that don't matter to say the things that do matter. And what we say matters. And how we say it matters. I can't tell you the amount of times that I had this particular argument with my sister of all people, but she will tell you that she is brutally honest. She's mean. <laughs> you can call it whatever else you want to, but she's just mean. Brutal honesty is a like halfway legitimizing excuse for it. What you say matters, but not just what you say, but how you say it. If somebody comes to you and says, man, dude, I'm, I love you, I'm worried about you, this is something that's going on in your life, and I think you need to remedy it. There's love in that, and that's the right way to say it, because you say what matters, and you say it the right way, but if you come to somebody just pointing fingers, I would never say that. <laughs> now you've crossed a different line. Now, 
what you say may be right, and the way you say it can be brutal. And instead of drawing people towards Christ, it pushes them away. What you say matters. And that's why I recap that first part, because we say we believe, and then we're supposed to do what we do, but we can't just walk through the motions either, and our mouth doesn't line up to those things. And the transformation that Christ performs in our lives is a complete transformation. It's not just portions of our lives that become transformed. So it's evidenced in those things. But in this particular section, I want us to focus on a, maybe something a little more specific. What you say matters, yes. And what you say about other believers matters even more. If Craig and I stand on this stage telling you all day why you shouldn't trust him and he's telling you why you shouldn't trust me, you know what's going to happen? You're not going to trust either of us. We're a part of the same body of Christ. All of us are. So when we say hateful things or mean things about one another, we're chastising and criticizing our own body. So it's important that we make sure that the things we're doing in that regard are, are things that involve biblical discipline from a love for our neighbor and not just simply being the Pharisee at the front of the temple, making sure that God knows we're not them. Their credibility is your credibility. It just is. If you convince people they don't need to believe in people in your church, they won't believe in you either. When you boast, it comes from an arrogant place that has no place in the life of a believer. And when we overly criticize other people, that's what we're doing. It's just an aggressive boast instead of a passive boast, or vice versa. We're saying they're bad, and by which we mean we're good. It comes from an arrogant place. And these verses cover some issues that talk about boasting and how that is. We place a brick in a wall that separates us from others when we begin to boast. I'm better than they are at this, or I have more than they are, or do. So we're going to talk about three, and the first one is boasting about others. We'll reread these verses so that you don't get lost in where we're at in them. James 4, 11 through 12 says, Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? It's like we comparison shop, you know. It's, uh, I'm a little better than this guy because I, I don't do this thing. I, we talked about this in Sunday school, about the fact that when you look around the world around us, there are all kinds of different people that come from varying different backgrounds, different races, ethnicities, different struggles, trials. But the fact of the matter is we have to remember that we do not deserve grace any more than they do. And it won't matter how many times we try to make the list longer on our side or shorter on our side, you still won't deserve it. It is a gift of God. Ephesians 2, right? We are saved by grace. Not by works. So that no one can boast. No one gets to say, well, I grew up in a better household. So I deserve grace more than somebody who grew up in a bad one. Nobody can say, oh, I've never struggled with addiction. So I deserve grace more than the person who has struggled with addiction. None of us gets to do that. And in these passages, that's what it's talking about. You're taking yourself out of the place 
where the law applies to you and shows you your sin and suddenly elevating yourself to a place where you can judge others on their sin. There's only one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy, but who are you to judge your neighbor? Jeremiah 9.8 says, Their tongue is a deadly arrow. It speaks deceitfully with his mouth. Each speaks peace to his neighbor, but in his heart he plans an ambush for him. When you start judging, when you begin thinking our standards are what matters instead of God's standards, James says for us to listen to the one true lawgiver and judge. Worry about our obedience more and everyone else's less. We can tend to boast about others and create barriers that are unfair and unwise. Second, we boast about tomorrow. James 4, 13 through 17 says, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, as it is, you boast in your arrogance and all such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is a sin. None of us has a guarantee of tomorrow. None of us. And too many of us boast in what we will do tomorrow. I'll, I'll start saying the right thing, the living the right way. I'll start witnessing for Christ tomorrow. I'll start it tomorrow. Monday morning I'm going to start it. Stop boasting about tomorrow. Today is the day. Today is the day you start to live for Christ, or not. If you choose today to leave and not live for Christ, so be it. But stop acting as if you have a guarantee of tomorrow. We boast in it as if it's owed to us. Shortly after service today, I get to travel north to do another funeral, and in that traveling, I'm going to see a man who had absolutely no health problems whatsoever. Cutting hay one day and three weeks later he's gone. Starts to cough while he's cutting hay and the next thing you know you have no guarantee of tomorrow. I have no guarantee of tomorrow. If we're going to live for the Lord, today is the day to live for the Lord. There is no tomorrow. Or no guarantee of it. Matthew 6, 34 says, Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Which to me is just kind of the flip side of this too. It's saying, look, even if you were guaranteed tomorrow, to worry about it is foolish. Deal with today. What will you do about your faith today? Not tomorrow. Not the next day. We need to remember who's in charge of today and tomorrow and it is not us. We do not get that boastful privilege. Third thing is boasting about riches. In America, I would say we struggle with this maybe more than any other country on earth. We are the, by far the richest country and we deal with this issue. James 5, 1 through 6 says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will, will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. 
and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. I want to stop there for just a second because where else do we see God's word speak of harvests and workers? Right. The harvest is plentiful and the labors are few. So it's important that we understand that when we're reading passages like this. You have laid up on earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. You have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. And you have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. I remember one time reading a quote that was by a uh, Jimmy Draper was the person's name, but he made the comment that, that the American church is probably the only church where the members of it will pass away with unused funds for the Lord. That so many other countries exhaust everything they have to be able to do that. But we live in a society that prizes riches, that prizes possessions. And somehow have turned that into a proof that God is active in our lives. It's often sold to us in the prosperity gospel of today. That somehow God's word really meant that one day we would have everything we ever wanted if we would just turn and follow him. When God's word is abundantly clear that it will cost you everything you have if you will follow him. important that we remember what he told us in Matthew 19 and 20 do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven whether where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is there your heart will be also but maybe even more important in this boasting aspect of what James is talking about is that not only will your heart be there, but your reliance will be. That we'll turn to our riches when all else fails rather than turning to our God. 1 Timothy 6, 9-10 through 10 says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Anything we boast in, apart from Christ, is something we need to repent of and return to our devotion and dependence on our Lord. Anything we boast in apart from Christ, including these three things that James highlights throughout these passages, we should instead boast in the cross and particularly boast in the fact that you should have been on it. Remember that. Sometimes we generalize what Christ did. You deserved the cross. And he took it for you. You want to boast in something? Boast in that. Boast in the fact that the Lord God sent his son to take your place and your punishment. Don't boast in how you measure up to other people. Don't measure in whether or not you have tomorrow to bank upon. Don't boast in whether or not you have enough money to get by. Boast in the cross. Boast in your salvation. Boast in the fact that although you were utterly undeserving, you were given a great gift by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, through His blood. And that it's available to others 
who may not look like us, talk like us, sound like us, vote like us, boast in your brotherhood and sisterhood. Plenty of times I've said one of the beauties of the church is the fact that when people come in and they say, I'm going through this or that, I may not have an answer for them at all. I may not have anything to offer them. But I know somebody in the church who does. Who's come through those circumstances. Who's lived through that and seen God deliver them and that can walk or help walk them through those circumstances. Which is part of the reason why the congregation has to be as involved as any staff member they ever ask for. Your testimony, your witness, the things God has done in your life are the ministry of this church. Boast in your brothers and sisters. To be able to point at someone and say, look what God did in this person's life not only builds the body of Christ up, but it will increase your witness. It will edify you. It will exalt you. It will encourage us. Listen to these words from Philippians 3. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. It means we don't boast in the flesh. We boast in our Lord. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as the law a Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For His sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and may share in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me His own. Brothers, I do not consider what I have that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. These words speak about the fact that nothing, no boasting in others, no boasting in tomorrow, no boasting of financial gain, no boasting in anything. There's only one thing to boast in, and that is Christ. Everything else is lost to us. You will not show up at the pearly gates with your list of the things I have done and impress anyone. You will show up boasting the name of Christ or you will face a judgment that will send you somewhere far from heaven and far from your desired result. So let us press on together to that high calling of Jesus Christ. Boast in our brotherhood and sisterhood. Boast in the cross. Boast in our salvation. 
And let us echo the words of James at the end of this passage where he says, you also be patient. That means be patient with one another. Be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. And just a few verses before that, he says, we wait for the fruit. We wait for the harvest. And that takes patience. There are times where I'm going to look at you and you're going to think, and I'm going to think, when's something finally going to happen in this person's life? And you're going to look at me and think those same things. We have to be patient. We have to boast in the Lord. We have to cling to His promises and we have to move forward together. We have to press on together to that high calling of Jesus Christ. So if we're going to boast, let's make sure we're boasting in Him.